This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. It's episode 700. And this week, we welcome Norris Gearhart, Executive Vice President of Regulatory and Business Practices at First On Site Property Restoration for a show on infection control risk assessment, disinfection, and diversification opportunities for restoration contractors. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They're the reason we can continue doing the show. And don't forget, after the show, check out afterthoughts.iaqradio.com to continue the discussion sponsored by First On Site Property Restoration. IAQ Radio Plus Marquee Sponsor is First On Site Property Restoration at firstonsite.com. IAQ Radio Association Sponsors are ACGIH, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists at ACGIH.org. AIHA, the American Industrial Hygiene Association at AIHA.org. IICRC, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification at IICRC.org. The Restoration Industry Association, RIA, at restorationindustry.org. The Environmental Information Association, EIA, at eia-usa.org. IAQ Radio Industry Sponsors are AEML Laboratories at aemlinc.com. Particles Plus at particlesplus.com. TSI Inc. at tsi.com. Tramex Meters at tramexmeters.com and Healthy Indoors Magazine at healthyindoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Don Weeks, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada who was first to identify the area of Southeast Kansas and Missouri as the place where three out of the five largest lead mines in the United States were located in 2021. The IQ Radio Trivia Question for today, May 19, 2023, has been sponsored by TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI.com. Here's today's IAQ Radio trivia question. Which U.S. president created the agency within the U.S. Department of Defense responsible for developing emergent technologies for use by the military? Back to you, Joe. Okay, today's guest is Norris Gearhart. He's the Executive Vice President of Regulatory and Business Practices at First On Site Property Restoration. He's had a long career as a solutions-focused leader, coach, and educator. He began his career in the restoration industry in 1985. He was also a contractor. He has had responsibilities in both restoration and the insurance realm over the span of nearly four decades. And during this time, Norris owned or has been part owner of two successful full-service restoration companies, building multi-million dollar books of business. Welcome, Norris. Great to see you. Great to be here. Thanks, Joe. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Hey, uh, Norris, let's start a little bit with, with your current role at uh, at First On Site. Uh, you, we were talking a little before the show. You've got a group of people working with you there, kind of overseeing the regulatory business practices. Sure. And so it's uh, that, that's a regulatory business practice. It's kind of like, what is that? Uh, even, even folks in houses are like, oh, that's great. What does that mean? <laughs> and so the areas that, that we uh, are really accountable for uh, are, are four. One is, one is our healthcare uh, work and, and operations. The other is <clears throat> asbestos and lead uh, abatement. And then we have indoor air quality and uh, HVAC. And then last but not least is the uh, biological and environmental hazard cleanup. Uh, so our responsibility is to 
to first and foremost, keep us out of trouble from a regulatory business practice standpoint with uh, all the state and federal laws that govern those uh, verticals in the in the business uh, across the country, but also to uh, quantify what our capabilities are at each location, uh, make sure that we have consistent uh, processes and protocols and the appropriate uh, training to uh, safely uh, and profitably manage that work. You know, we're going we're gonna to talk a lot about sanitization, disinfection, sterilization, and, and I'd kind of like to first kind of establish the uh, definitions, but, but also um, maybe talk a little bit about who, what, when you work with people in the field, do they understand the differences between sanitization, disinfection, and sterilization? Absolutely not. <laughs> I, I, I have to say that uh, during COVID, uh, I was extremely busy um, answering questions and, and helping people solve problems. But the thing that, 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 that jumped out to me and was really disheartening is how completely ignorant we are as an, as an industry across the country. Uh, we basically, and, and I'm, I'm painting with a broad brush, so understand that. Uh, and I, I fall into this category, or certainly did when I operated my own businesses. But we don't take the time to really understand the tools and the supplies uh, that we use. Uh, and we blindly accept what people tell us. And we don't really understand the labels if we even read them. And consequently, we, uh, we say a lot of the wrong things and we do a lot of very ineffective things. And... Let's go down the list. So san as I understand it, it's sanitization, disinfection, and sterilization. Can you give us a quick kind of uh, definition of, or differentiation between those three things? Yeah, and I, I can tell you that uh, <clears throat> those, th those three things mean different things to different agencies. Uh, one of the biggest, the biggest challenges that I see out there is we throw, we throw terms like cleaning, sanitizing, decontamination, disinfecting, uh, around interchangeably and inappropriately all the time. I take a look at, at companies' web pages or or marketing material or even uh, manufacturer and suppliers of products to our industry, and the misuse of those terms is uh, is just gross out there. So to answer your question a little bit, uh, and and where I sort of stand is, listen. We need to use those terms in the appropriate context and, and be very specific about our language uh, and, and make sure that uh, we're using them in the right context and quoting, quoting that place. So cleaning across the board really re refers to removing dirt or organic load, typically mechanical removal, removing that visible dirt. That's, that's pretty straightforward. But when we jump into sanitizing, and sanitizing is probably one of the most misused terms I see in our industry, uh, it depends. Are we talking about products who are registered for use with the EPA or the FDA? Because they have very different requirements from an, uh, both a pathogen organism uh, target as well as a log reduction in, in that, that bio load. So sanitizing to the EPA means a three log reduction on a, on a different set of, of target pathogens, whereas sanitizing to the FDA on, on hard, non-porous food prep surfaces in particular, but in general, uh, whether it be for food prep or, or human uh, tools, uh, is a five log reduction of a different set of target pathogens. So when someone says, oh, I'm gonna clean and sanitize something, I'm like, really? So, so what are you really doing? Tell me what you're doing. Uh, one of the other things that we get into is disinfection. We talk about disinfecting. Oh, I disinfected that, really? What did you do? Did you validate that you disinfected that with some sort of a, a protocol test or something to demonstrate that you were effective with your process? Because if you didn't, you can't really say you disinfected it. You could say you applied a disinfectant for the manufacturer's guidance. That's an appropriate specific term. But to just say you broadly disinfected it, I'm going to eat you up on the stand, right? So in disinfecting under the FDA, that's a six log reduction. Again, Different pathogens, different different applications. With the uh, EPA, it's a five log reduction. So what are we talking about when you say disinfectant? And then when we get into decontamination, 
if you look at the, the, the actual definition in the, the uh, um, uh, yeah, that, that book that has definitions in it, the dictionary, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're really, we're really not inappropriately using that term. However, in the context of where we work and the regulatory agencies who, who govern the registration of the products and the equipment that we're using, we really kind of are. I mean, seldom do we anywhere in the industry actually decontaminate anything under those definitions. What we do is we clean and we apply a disinfectant or we clean and we apply a sanitizer. Or what about the level of sterilization? Do we ever see that in a restoration project? No, no. When we get into sterilization, now now we're talking uh, about removing all uh biological contaminants, uh, whether that, that be uh, uh, spores, viruses, molds, bacteria, to a, to a six log reduction level uh, or greater. Now, is that and, and we really are not doing that. Is it removal or, uh, I, I want to make sure I get the right term. You're, you're... No, you're absolutely right. It's either killing or uh, uh, deactivating those. Okay, okay. Cliff, let me let you jump in here. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I think with, um, you know, with sterilization, some of the organisms are a lot harder and they're organisms, uh, you know, spore forming organisms that have, you know, some pretty tough spores that are, that are difficult to penetrate. But I agree with Norris that there is a lot of misinformation in the marketplace and some of it does start with the agencies. And, you know, for instance, EPA is pretty tough when you around the world sterilization, but yet they will allow certain devices, which have very little or no data to claim that they're sterilizing air. So, um, you know, they're they're pretty inconsistent. But um, and I'm wondering, Cliff, back in your time in manufacturing, you were made. Primarily looking at EPA, not EPA, FDA, correct? No, e EPA, right. So, you know, they're. It's just, you know, and the logs are, you know, like 99.9 .9 is is three logs, you know, 99.99 .99 is four logs, 99.999 is five logs. And, um, you know, there's a pretty significant difference in the difficulty uh, of passing and the organisms that you're killing at, at different levels. You know, uh, they're, you know, and I think, you know, going back to COVID, you know, you know to me, there was just such a gross overreaction of uh, the deadliness of COVID and how worried people were about it and so on and so forth. And if you look at a hierarchy of uh, pathogens, uh, it's, you know, among the easiest right. uh, to, to neutralize. But, but, you know, people just really didn't get it and they automatically jumped to, well, you know, we need to sterilize our facility and uh, you know, high level disinfection and, and so on and so forth. And when you're using those higher level products, you know, there are more safety concerns and PPE concerns and occupant concerns and material and also, concerns and so on and so forth. Yeah. And, and, Is it also and, more um, expensive? Generally. Oh, yeah. And, okay. And, and, and one of the, one of the gross misuses uh, along those lines and, and, uh, you know, I, I actually, when Cliff was, was still going through all those, uh, uh, studies and stuff there were times i reached out to him was like hey wait a second and and i really i really know he's, he's got a, a great deal of experience in this but as part of those registrations is the application process right. and uh you know the products were being inappropriately used uh inappropriately applied uh with the techniques that were used which which has the potential to change the efficacy of the product has the potential to change the uh the safety of the product uh it, it just a general gross ignorance within our industry, sadly. Well, part of it's on the part of the EPA as well, because if I'm not mistaken, I think the first product uh, that, that I think I ever saw with a claim, you know, around the HVAC systems and so on and so forth was Lysol because they had approved it for the vents and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. And then, you know, I remember Bob Baker got, you know, the first duck claim and uh, we got the second. And, you know, we were kind of able to, uh, you know, to kind of ride his coattails, uh, you know, through the EPA registration process because, you know, he had kind of established it. And we happened to have shared the same EPA registration consultant who, uh, 
uh, you know, it was it was interesting. But yeah, you're you're absolutely right. And then they have these now emerging pathogens, and you know, everyone. I remember when AIDS uh, came out, and they were trying to kill HIV on surfaces. They actually had to sacrifice a monkey uh, in, in order to do it, and they had a lab monkey and. I forget this lab monkey cost probably six figures, right. you know, because it had to be genetically correct and so on and so forth. And, you know, so, cause that was the closest they ever did. I think uh, on like human testing, I mean, they really, and I remember a company, uh, you know, spent the money and, and did it and so on and so forth. But, so it's funny how life cycles back around during that time, Cliff, I was working as a laboratory animal tech, uh, with a combination of Yasimrat and, and a private tech uh, working with uh, HIV research on that. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, because I think it was Gibraltar uh, uh, Laboratories, I think, was the was the firm that, that first did it because they actually were marketing a quad-type disinfectant product as well. And, um, you know, they, they, they knew the protocol and were willing to spend the money. And, um, you know, sometimes those decisions can be a very, very good investment. I mean, if you can get through the EPA, you know, that's the, that's the whole challenge. Absolutely. What, what do you think something like that would have cost them, Cliff? What? How much would uh, it have cost them? I, 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 know, I, I, well, I suspect they did all the laboratory work themselves, but I, I know that they had to, you know, they had to buy the monkey and then, you know, have, I, I guess, veterinarians or whoever, tech, techs, you know, do the actual, work on the monkey i mean they they did the lab results and you know they, they had to get it you know isolate the organism and so on and so forth so um i would say hundreds of thousands of dollars i don't think it was millions but i mean you know to get a new active ingredient uh you know that's going to be millions of dollars because you have to have all this testing toxicity testing and so on and so forth they already had all that stuff done because they used an existing uh quant formulation but they were just able to prove that it was able to kill HIV, which I think they knew it would at the beginning because they knew the organism, you know, that, you know, it's a, it's a virus and, you know, it's going to be relatively easy to kill. So. I wonder if you two see any similarities between, I don't, I wasn't as involved in this part of the industry when HIV became a big issue. Um, but Maybe we could look at how HIV was handled and also how COVID was handled when it comes to uh, sanitization, disinfection, sterilization. Um, were you guys involved with this? Well, apparently, Cliff, you were whenever HIV came out. Mm -hmm. Was there the same kind of reaction uh, to, let's say, hospital facilities or doctor's offices that had patients with HIV? Did they go in and, and sterilize the offices? I think that people didn't understand it, you know, initially didn't understand the disease, didn't really understand the transmission uh, of of the disease. But, you know, when it came to disinfecting hard services, you know, disinfecting instruments and so on and so forth, that was relatively easy. But and, and Norris can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was HIV when all the bloodborne pathogen requirements came out. You know, how are we going to deal with? with bloodborne pathogens, you know, somebody bled on it or they had other bodily fluids, yeah. you know, on it. And I think that's where a lot of that stuff happened because you then had to, anytime there was a workplace incident, you know, you cut your finger in an office, you know, all of a sudden, you know, it triggers these bloodborne pathogen regulations, you know, and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And I think in certain situations, yeah, it was good. I think a lot of people were protected, and I think they protected the transmission. And you know, I'm I'm okay with that. You know, no, I agree. Of course, were you you were in the lab at that point in time? You weren't doing the restoration work, huh? Correct, correct. Okay, all right. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about in fact, uh, or let's let's talk about this first. What kind of opportunities would restorations firms have to diversify? to obtain some, you know, year-round cash flow. It looks like a lot of them jumped into disinfecting offices and disinfecting buildings and going into the healthcare world. Do you think that's a good opportunity for these folks? I, I think there are all over the place. That is a good opportunity if they invest the time to learn what they're doing. 
Uh, sadly, most of the folks who jumped into it just saw dollar signs uh, and uh, approached it very haphazardly. And to Cliff's point, fortunately, um, COVID was you know a large envelope virus that is probably the easiest organism that we'll ever deal with. And hopefully we never see a, a small non-envelope virus pandemic because the way we handled this one, we're going to wipe out half the planet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so I, I, I think there are great opportunities there. Uh, and that spills over into the biohazard uh, cleanup that, that typically goes hand in hand as people get involved with that. But without the, the proper uh, training uh, certifications, you know, I, I, we, we have industry certifications. To me, the certifications don't mean a lot. It's, 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 the, uh, it's the knowledge that people come away with, the functional knowledge. But without that, not only are these folks putting their people at risk, their businesses at risk, but they're putting the occupants of wherever they're working at risk as well. And fortunately for our industry, uh, as you know, my opinion, is because this uh, COVID virus was so easy, many companies dodged a bullet that would have put them in the grave. Mm. Well, That's I, a good I, point. I never thought of that. Go ahead, know, I, I, I think the one thing that, um, you know, it's kind of like scuba diving and, you know, you, you can go to a class and typically there's a lot, you know, you, you do certain parts of it with the book or you watch some tapes and then you either get into a swimming pool, or you jump into a lake or you, you jump into an ocean and then you kind of have to actually do it. And, and I think that the hands on component is just really, really important, you know, Absolutely. when it comes to, to biohazards. Just, you know, how do you know your respirators fitted properly and so on and so forth? And I mean, you have to check all those things. And I think doing it and 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 having someone who's experienced in doing it, watch you do it and make the corrections and, and so on and so forth. I think that certain skills or certain certifications, I think, should have a mandatory hands on uh, component. I don't know that you need it for everything, but there's certain things, you know, where you need it. it, it you know, it's like putting gold leaf on a steeple or whatever. <laughs> you're, you're not going to, uh, you know, you're not going to read the label and then go do it. You know, you right. really need the experience and correct tools and everything. So. And one of the things I see is contractors begin to look at this and see dollar signs and start moving into it is, well, they, hey, we got the equipment, we've got the PPE, you know, we've got all the tools and experience we need to do this. This is just a new way to deploy it. Uh, well, sadly, we've been working with, with PPE and this equipment for a very long time in relatively low risk environments. And I, I'll, I'll use mold for an example. And how often do we walk onto a job or even see people publish pictures where they're not wearing the respiratory uh, protection properly, where they're not donning or doffing PPE properly, or we're working with, with sewage or some other uh, biohazard that is visible to the eye. And because there's relatively low transmission or relatively low risk, we've gotten extremely sloppy with our processes. And when you get into uh, contagions and stuff that's smaller than your eye is going to see, you can't be sloppy. You got to do it the right way every time. And and that's got to be a change of mindset for our, our staff that's out there doing the work. Well, speaking of things that you, you got to be careful with, let's talk a little bit about ICRA, Infection Control Risk Assessment. And first, what, what industries follow ICRA? Is it just hospitals or are there other it's groups that are also involved? Currently, it's just hospital. It's it's mandated that uh, anything that's done to that building envelope in that hospital and ICRA be completed. Now, that's the only real mandate. Uh, they don't have to follow a specific format. Uh, as long as there's one done and published to evaluate the risk around that work site and to, to mitigate any potential harm to, to the patients or building occupants. Uh, you'll see the... Um, uh, quite a variety of infection control risk assessment documents. Uh, and really that in ICRA is nothing more than a if this, then that matrix that causes you to go through those questions and then develop a, a process for how you're going to do the work or protect the areas while you're you're doing the work. Uh, most of the, the country had sort of adopted the original CDC four level format um, or some slight variation of that. Now, last year, late last year, time flies, might have been a year and a half ago, two years now, 
I guess Ashery came out or Ashy came out with what they call ICRA 2.0 and have really been um, promoting that that pretty heavily. Uh, I I like it. Uh, you know, I, I <laughs> uh, some of the things that are incorporated into the ICRA 2.0 are are things that uh, JJ Jenkins, who's a CIH and and was the founder of the Construction Infection Control Training Institute, uh, and I worked together with uh, training people over the last five years, uh, which include particle count reduction and and some of the other things that are highlighted in there. So part of me is really happy to see that because I feel like it made a difference. The other part's kind of like, hey, man, we, we're the ones taught you that, <laughs> you know? Uh, <laughs> but that is, is very uh, heavily being promoted and we're seeing a lot of the large hospital systems adopt it. And that strays from the original four levels of, of ICRA uh, to, to adding a fifth level, which has some very subtle nuances in it. Uh, but ICRA itself essentially takes a look at where you're doing the work, uh, what work is going to occur, what's going on around it, and then dictates what levels of precaution and protection are, are necessary if you fit X criteria. And, and that includes both engineering controls and PPE? Yes. So depending on the level, they're going to give you, and these are recommended? Yes. It's not a regulation. It's a, uh, a standard, but most hospitals are going to have someone that's going to at least kind of confirm that they're following the, that standard? That falls on the infection control pr or the infection practitioner uh, within the hospital. Those guys uh, are the ones who will develop that ICRA. Uh, once you develop a, a, a trust with those folks, it's great because they'll they'll allow us to work with them in the development of that ICRA. And very often, the infection control uh, practitioner, and I'm, I, I don't mean to, to slander them in any way, but they're nurses. They didn't go through can, building science classes, you know. So so they'll they'll take uh, and that 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 guideline and create. Uh, what they believe is is appropriate recommendations for those engineering controls, but they may not understand what's involved in doing the actual work. And sometimes uh, there's a disconnect there. Yeah, actually, because it, it's essentially construction work, and you've got people who are trained in medicine and in the medical area right. trying to help oversee construction work. But that leads to a good question that came in from Bruce here. Uh, can you let the audience know who should be involved in the ICRA assessment besides the contractor? In most cases, um, the contractor is going to be given that ICRA assessment. Uh, you're not going to be the one developing it, though it's really important for the contractor to know and understand that because as they respond to, for instance, an after-hour emergency call, they need to really recognize that that infection practitioner is not going to be there probably till the morning and that they need to proceed with beginning to stabilize and mitigate the damage that are there. And they need to understand the steps and precautions based on an evaluation of that site that you would use that ICRA matrix document to, to help determine as they, as they begin those emergency processes. Now, once Everyone gets there, you're going to have all the stakeholders involved around that table and everyone's got their own little agenda. You'll have the facilities folks there. You'll have the environmental services folks who are responsible for, for cleaning and maintaining the building. You'll have the infection control folks there. And you may have the department heads or any other folks who, who are potential stakeholders uh, around that table discussing uh, the, the challenges and, and your way you're going to move forward. Now, when most of these ICRA assessments that you see, are they coming from the hospital or is the hospital hiring a third party consultant like a CIH or someone like that? They're, they're being developed by the hospital. More often than not, huh? Yeah, yeah. They, they may break, bring in a, a, an industrial hygienist or, or like I said, uh, if they've got a good trusting relationship with the, with the vendor there, they'll be a part of that. But they're being developed by the, by the hospital. They're the ones with the ultimate responsibility. The infection practitioner is the one who has to sign off on that ICRA before work begins, get posted outside of the containment. Um, and it's 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 a pretty tight system. And that person has to be able to um, show that they've had training on ICRA, correct? Is that? I wouldn't go that far. I, I, okay. I can't, I can't definitively answer that for you, but the, I, from experience, uh, hopefully, yes. Hopefully they've had some training. Yeah. Yeah. But there's no, again, it's not regulated. So 
it's kind of tough to say you must have X. Now, of course, the hospital could say you must have had a training course on this topic. Sure. And, and, and uh, with the, the regular, uh, the, the crediting bodies who uh, credit the facilities to be able to receive uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement, uh, the Joint Commission is, is the big one that most people know. There's, there's several other accrediting bodies. They certainly have criteria as well that the, uh, the, the organization is, is rated and judged by. So they're, it's not completely the Wild West in any way. It's far from that. Okay. Well, we'll get back into that a little bit. I want to talk about what other services restoration contractors may be able to diversify into after we stop and thank our sponsors here at halftime. Our marquee sponsor is First On Site, your trusted full service disaster recovery and property restoration company at firstonsite.com. Our association sponsors are ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, ACGIH.org, AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org, The Environmental Information Association, EIA's Multidisciplinary Membership, collects, generates, and disseminates information concerning environmental and occupational health hazards in the built environment at eia-usa.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, iicrc.org. The Restoration Industry Association, the oldest and largest nonprofit professional trade association dedicated to providing leadership and promoting best practices through advocacy, standards, and professional qualifications for the restoration industry at restorationindustry.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, free shipping, great pricing, same day results with no rush fee, AEML inc.com particles plus feature rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation count on us particles plus.com tsi inc an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air learn how to expand your iaq investigations tsi.com tramex meters developing modern dynamic moisture meters and humidity monitoring systems since 1974 tramexmeters.com and healthy indoors magazine a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers healthyindoors.com all right we're back with norris gearhart evp of regulatory and business practices at first on site cliff let me get get you to start the second half okay well um you taught a new class, a new course for RIA, and it dealt with uh, a lot of the same subject matter that, that we're discussing today. So I really have a two-part uh, question. When people come out of that class, who are they going to market their services to, and how do you suggest that they market those services to the potential clients? Well, the class, the class is uh, the environmental risk specialist uh, and had a great team to help develop that. Uh, and uh, when RIA asked me to, to chair that development uh, committee, they didn't give me a lot of guidance. And that's always dangerous because then I'm going to do whatever I feel I'm <laughs> <up> to do. <laughs> uh, and and, and they, they let me run with it. Um, uh, certainly uh, what I saw out there uh, over the last uh, five or six years, it's been a real concern for me is a, a, an ignorance in our industry of a lot of the risks that we walk into every day. Uh, you know, we, we jump on our white horse and put our cape on and, and we ride into to whatever that call was and we'll figure it out when we get there. Uh, and sadly, uh, we walk into a, a lot of very hazardous environments unknowingly uh, and then very, very often proceed to try and uh, uh, remediate or or repair or in some other way move forward with a project without fully being aware of the risks that are present. And so my goal with the environmental risk specialist class for RIA was to give those folks the tools to recognize when they should step back, not to make them specialists or experts in any of the areas, but just like 
uh, with contents, you know, one of the things that, that you know, Cliff always taught with contents and Marty both was, uh, you know, you walk in and look at that painting. You don't know whether that's a, you know, a Rembrandt or something that, the, you know, their high school kid did in art unless you really know what you're looking at and to recognize that you don't know what you're looking at and to, to get someone else who does involved. So the course was built on an outline of CBRNE, the chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear uh, outlines, and each one of those types of things. So we look at uh, everything from, from chemical spills to improvised explosives of what you might walk into in a, in a property and say, oh, okay, here's, here's a risk assessment. Uh, that uh, that we should use and here's some other resources that we need to get involved and, and really when to say no and when to partner with experts in it uh, so how to market that uh specifically it would really be in just understanding uh the helping helping potential clients usually they would be com commercial or industrial clients uh know that that we have that baseline understanding of risk awareness uh, I guess. So it's a little different course than anything that's out there in the industry. And, and the final project on that is, is doing a, a pretty substantial risk assessment uh, for a project using the ABRA, Association of Biolo uh, I always mess up this acronym. Uh, Tom, Tom Licker is going to hate me. Association of Biological, um, a, oh, what is it? ABRA, A-B-R-S-A. And in I any don't. case, uh, Abra.org, they have done a really, really good job of creating a risk assessment template uh, for biological hazards and um, and environmental hazards and, and using that to really assess the risk and what the next steps would be before just blindly getting started. It's American Bio Recovery Association. Thank you. Thank That's you it. very much. That's <laughs> it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um... I guess a couple. Of, I guess a couple of thoughts. Um, you know, both of us have, have walked into uh, probably hundreds, maybe even thousands of fire losses uh, over the, over the years, yep. and and I think we both know that you know people that fight fires, firefighting, uh, you know that action, uh, you know exposes firefighters, uh, you know to significant hazards, and those people do suffer. Uh, higher, uh, I, I guess, risks for respiratory issues, uh, and 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 so on and so forth. And you know, one of the things that Marty always preached, and you know, was that you know the hazardous substances kind of settle out, you know, in, in a matter of hours, and, and and so on and so forth. And then it and then it's a, a much safer uh, in, in environment. And I think there's. So, you know, right now, a debate, I think, in the industry in how far to take this. And, and I think what happens is, uh, I, I think the same thing when mold came out, Norris, you had mold minimizers mm -hmm. and you had mold maximizers. And I think the answer is really somewhere in the middle. But I mean, some of the things that I, I and, and and I think the one thing that that we know is that uh, you know, from the restoration industry, I mean, you know, RIA has probably approaching 2,000 member firms, and there's mm -hmm. tens of thousands of employees. And a lot of these employees have been working in these companies for a long time, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. And, you know, we have not had the same types of medical issues show up among restoration workers that has shown up among firefighters. And, uh, yeah. So what do you think uh, needs to be done and how do you think we should handle it? Well, I, I agree with you uh, with the, the, the two, the, the pendulum swing minimizers and, and, and folks are out there and, and trying to find that 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 happy medium. Um, I don't necessarily concur with the fact that we haven't seen the types of, of uh, exposure issues that firefighters have simply because we haven't had the type of surveillance that the firefighters have. Uh, we don't have that oversight uh, and surveillance within our industry. We don't have that, that long legacy. We don't have people that come in uh, and, and have their health documented over a 20 year career period. I personally, from, from being very negligent, uh, particularly with respiratory protection, 
in many of these hazardous environments now have uh, upper respiratory damage into to my lungs and part of the hoarseness you hear in my voice is a result of that. That is a result of a continued repeated exposure to environmental hazards. Uh, it, it was cumulative. It really didn't rear its ugly head to the last couple of years. So I, I think we don't have a lot of information there, but, but we don't have a lot of information going forward uh, as to how to best approach it. My recommendation is to, to always proceed um, with caution, but with reason. Uh, and we, as, a, as a race, we don't do a great job with that middle ground. <laughs> So until there's until there's some some standards, which I know I know you're working on, Cliff. I know there's a lot of stuff out there, uh, but even with that, um, one of one of the challenges I see with the standards that have been written in our industry is, and and I see this changing. I'm involved in the uh, the S410, which is a, a, a infection control and commercial building standards of the IICRC right now. Is most of these standards committees were comprised of all of us within the industry. And, and kind of rolling together our, our own collective uh, experience and patting each other on the back and saying, yeah, that sounds good. Uh, and often we haven't brought in true scientific experts in those areas to be a part of that discussion. And, and I see that changing. So I, I think that the jury's really still out on that. I think that there's absolutely, and particularly as we go in and begin to disturb that fire scene, uh, much greater, particularly respiratory risks than we, um, than we prepare for in many of these environments. You know, I, I think that, you know, my positions, you know, I, I think there's some similarities, but I think there's some differences. You know, the reason that you had oversight in firefighters is that there were, you know, significant issues, you know, like, uh, you know, for instance, uh, you know, cleaning up after 9 11 and, 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 and so on and so forth. And, I think it became necessary because people were getting sick and people were getting the same types of illnesses and the same types of sicknesses. And I think that's one of the things that probably drew uh, a lot of attention. Uh, so my question would it. be, if, yeah. if if the firefighters weren't involved, let's use 9-11, and I'm just being pragmatic here. Uh, if, if the firefighters weren't involved, which means there's public funding and taxes involved, if they weren't involved, would there have been the same sort of uh, acknowledgement and response to the private sector from a health risk after that event? I don't know. You know, I, 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 again, I, I, I honestly uh, don't know. But I, I think what happened is, I mean, you look at the military. I mean, you, you have these issues with the burn pits and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and so on and so forth. And, you know, I think the government often goes into denial first. And then, uh, you know, when it's forced upon them, uh, right. they, they do the right thing. But I think that's the same thing that industry does as well. You know, I think sometimes they'll go into denial and then, you know, when it's forced upon them, they'll do the right thing. But I, I'm not sure that the government looks at it uh, I, the way industry does. I think industry says, well, you know, what's it going to cost us in terms of litigation and so on and so forth? And they... And, and they look at these things, you know, they, they consider lives and they, they look at, you know, what's the risk and what's the cost. I'm not sure that the government actually looks at it like that, but, um, you know, I honestly, I honestly don't know. As a guy who goes to the VA, I can tell you, I think they look at a business case pretty hard and say, let's see how many times we can deny stuff and save some money. Right. <laughs> no, but, uh, well, actually, they, uh, denied, you know, I had the same issue. They actually denied my benefits, but that's a whole <laughs> other discussion. But, right. Uh, I've, you know, I've got to go, go ahead. No, well, the one thing I would say, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a, a obviously a consolidation of the industry, a change. And we're moving away from uh, independent business operators of, of essentially small businesses where these things go undetected, un, unresponded to, uh, and, you know, not really there to to larger organizations uh, that are going to prompt greater regulatory oversight of existing regulations. And I think as we move forward as an industry, we're gonna see some shifts and some different data uh, that, that are more in line with larger industries and with government in some of these risk environments that we work in. 
All right, let me squeeze in a text question here, and then we're going to go to the roundup. The uh, Restoration Industries Global Watchdog is going to join us here for the roundup. Uh, but I've got a, a question. Please comment on my strategies for COVID, COVID sanitizing. My initial approach based on lack of information was frequent comprehensive sanitizing. Since subsequent research suggests that fomite spread is not significant, I suggest high touch sanitizing where feasible and hand washing as a precaution against recently contaminated surface. What do you think, Norris? It's pretty much the guidance that's out there. The very first thing I would say is, is the, the use of the term sanitizing repeatedly define how you mean it in this case. Uh, you know, if, if you're going to use one of these terms in the world, according to Norris, just like an insurance policy, there should be a definition of what that term is how you're applying it to that context. Otherwise, that's pretty much the guidance I think we've seen from, from the, the CDC and, and NIH. So I guess, and, and I know Ed knows sanitizing well, and, and uh, but I guess in, the, in retrospect, was going around and hitting all these buildings with high-powered, you know, uh, disinfectants, was that a waste of money? I think it was. And one of the other concerns that, that I, I had when we were doing that was uh, the, the just like antibiotics, the overuse of the big guns and the potential uh, resistant organisms that we may be developing within the environment, not to mention the residuals that may be left behind from the inappropriate use of these products to the health and safety, long term health and safety of, of the building occupants. Yeah, it was a tough situation for a lot of restoration people. I know my local guy here, he kept getting calls to go out and sanitize or disinfect facilities, and he kept telling people, that's not what you need. You need this, and they would end up hiring somebody else who was willing to come in and do whatever the heck they asked. So, and Joe, I got I got put on the spot a lot during COVID uh, with those types of questions, and and I I came back with, with this, and, and this is really – you know, anyone that's been in any of my classes heard me say this up front's an explanation, the back end's an excuse, right? And and listen, they're going to spend that money. They feel that they're going to need to spend that money. Someone's going to take that money. It might as well be us or me. However, in the upfront documentation, not only to cover my butt, to make sure that I'm completely transparent, I spell out all of these things, the definitions, the uh, potential efficacy, whether or not this has any great value, uh, you know, the residual coatings, things like that, which we're not going to go down that path, but make sure that it's very clear that there's no ambiguity there and, and then take their money. <laughs> All right. Let's go to the roundup, John. All right. The roundup this week sponsored by Tramex, Tramex moisture meters, Let's get to the restoration industry global watchdog. Pete, do we have you on? Yeah. So I I was gonna try to call hi Norris. I was gonna try to call in uh to do the sound and the audio check, but the program started. So by the time I called in, you had just introduced Norris and I've been on there ever since. I'm just sitting in my recliner here in Bernita Springs, relaxed. You got a little light I can see here, so I'm I'm on my iPad and uh Anyway, can you hear me okay? You're good. All right. Well, listen, I, I usually don't call in for too many. Uh, you know, mostly I always call in on all the shows that I help organize and uh, and the ones that I'm really interested in. And so it's not by accident that I happen to call in for today's show because uh, I, would, I wouldn't miss my buddy Norris talking about all these topics. And I kind of, what I enjoyed most was that little exchange back there between Cliff and Norris. I thought that was good because they agree on most stuff, but they respectfully disagree on others. And that's, that's okay because um, I think through differing opinions and viewpoints and out of a good debate is where you really find the best answers and solutions. And everybody wants everything to be right or wrong or black and white. And unfortunately, the world doesn't go, doesn't work like that. So the one thing I want to say to Norris is, you know, this, your message that you're, been, you're talking about now and espousing and certainly everything that was built into the to the ERS course, even though I didn't get a chance to get down there when you rolled it out in Miami last December, um, I was planning on trying to, and maybe I will at some point in the future, but 
you know, I've heard enough good stuff about it. And like it, like any of these advanced courses, when they first get rolled out, you do the betas, they evolve. It takes a little while before they kind of are, are synced in like some of the other ones that are more mature. So I think that's a really important part of the four pillars that's going to lead up to eventually the new CR program, you know, and kind of the career path in the industry. So, uh, you know, um, good work and all of that, Norris. And congratulations on your volunteer to your, uh, the year award that you got at RAA, too. Thank you. Uh, uh, Well-deserved. Now, let me kind of comment on some of the stuff. I, I can only talk to my own personal experience. And I, I've been an advocate for just not only knowing and understand the words that we use and the implications that they have, but also the potential risk and the, uh, the risk that project managers and business owners have on their employees. And I can tell you in, in the seventies, I learned it through the carpet and upholstery cleaning industry, which was, you know, the gateway for many of us at, at, the, at that era that got into water damage work and then eventually into the fire. And there were two old timers that had been working there um, through the early years of the development of the on-location carpet cleaning and uh, all the different methods in the big implant rug cleaning. These two guys were about 50 years old and you would have thought they were 70. And the, the, the raspiness in their voices and the, um, <clears throat> uh, the skin irritations and everything they had, I think that was based on just a lack of knowledge or ignorance of following a, a lot of the, the OSHA regulations and just the, the practices that are, are fairly commonplace today and I made a decision then that when I was responsible for, um, you know, running jobs, uh, you know, uh, being involved in enforcement and compliance of just good common sense regulations around safety and health, I didn't want to be the person who's on that watch. I'd ex explain to somebody's wife or their kids or their family, you know, why they were highly affected and, uh, either had some kind of a lifelong workman's comp claim or in some cases even worse. And I was lucky. I learned it early in my career when I was in my twenties, you know, but talking about Cliff, you know, when during the WLI years in the nineties, when we were trying to, the industry started to kind of move and was starting to mature rapidly in the water mold and environmental area, you know, Cliff mentioned it, you know, you had a lot of these guys who were, uh, they either were extremists in their viewpoints well, they were very nonchalant about it and no big deal. You know, you guys talked a little bit about 9-11 and the firemen, but the other one are the plumbers. You know, when we started doing a lot of the sewage work and crawling under these homes and doing stuff like that, and a lot of people talked about the plumbers. So, well, the plumbers don't wear all this gear or, you know, they're, you know, why do you guys need to wear it? Well, probably if you go deep into the annals of stories of plumbers and rotor rooter guys who maybe didn't take proper, uh, proper precautions, there's a good chance that they had, some of these afflictions that uh, that um, Norris that you were talking about uh, from continued exposure. There's a lot of stories like that of people who had high exposure to mold. And, you know, a friend and, the, and a guy, a very close friend of, of, of the industry and really uh, mining close is Lee Pemberton. Lee, Lee always talked openly about his early years in the dry cleaning industry and the exposure to 111 trichlor and how a lot of people in dry cleaning got sensitivities every time they were on dry cleaning. So it's the same type of thing. Um, when it really became front and center for me was in the mid nineties um, when I was involved in hurricane Bonnie uh, and um, with a whole group of uh, REA members and um, public adjusters and uh, just a variety of people. And, and I remember one of the clients there, one of these meetings said, you know, we, we don't want your guys out there looking like every job looking like the Pillsbury Doughboy. This was the this was what was said by one of these big uh, um, building owners who was the client for a lot of companies doing all the work down there to restore a lot of that property just before the Labor Day weekend, and they were very concerned with wanting to uh, you know they didn't want to lose the big income weekend, and uh, you know at one particular point I said the biggest exposure that they had weren't from their customers was from their own employees. They had some of their employees that working in these mold infested buildings, trying to keep them open and get them open. So they didn't miss the income for the big Labor Day weekend. And they were coughing. They had asthma attacks. They were out. I said, do you really need an expert to come in and tell you like why you're supposed to be more cautious? At, you know, they're coughing and choking in that 
have an asthma attack. So you don't need a CIH or some expert to tell you, well, you know, they shouldn't be in there or they, they should have some protection or they should do something like that. And, you know, and now it's kind of evolved to where we're at now and people still have this don't look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Well, you know, sometimes some of these projects in and maybe, you know, you know more about this than me, but a lot of the clients, you have to come up with solutions because you don't want to alarm the public. So you have to either put a special, um, you know, uh, 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 kind of staging up and uh, I don't want to say hide stuff, but you don't want to make stuff as visible. Uh, that also Pete, I would agree. I think yeah. as, as part of being a professional is having that discretion and being able well, to exactly. create this, your engineering this, controls that, that provide that, that, that appropriate public facing image. Right. This is what I was setting the table for you to do. I'm glad you jumped in, but I needed a breath. But, but, but my point was, is that you have to convince the clients that maybe you have to put the crews on after hours and you have to do them at different times. It can't be done during the day and they have to calculate that cost. And if there's an overtime cost or something, and eventually they worked through that. And the thing that was most satisfying, and I don't really want to mention any of the companies because everyone don't know who they are. But I remember on the, on the, uh, during the height of the Labor Day weekend on Virginia Beach in, the, in 1995, after Hurricane Bonnie, there was a million people on the beach. And a lot of those properties were restored by our friends and people that we know in the industry. And I remember the, the managers of one of those properties, there was a big plane, that one of those sky planes that had a big commercial tag in the end. And they basically thanked all the remediators and restoration companies that helped restore the property. That's more than, than worth more than anything anybody could say when the customers publicly recognized that and thanked them by company name and the team and the group of people that were down there. And, uh, you know, and there are a lot of lessons that should be learned from 9-11. They're all pub they're public about uh and, and and a lot of those issues that happened after 9 11 was because the government the city of new york the people they did not they were a little nervous they didn't want to alarm the public and uh and so there's documented cases of people that uh you know unfortunately uh passed away from the exposures and i think in some cases they probably knew better but you know the job of the restoration companies and the environmental consultant in our industry is to present this information in a way that's palatable, that people understand it. You're not alarmist, it's necessary. It needs to be built into the cost and you need to weigh and balance the benefits against the scope. And I think, you know, in particular with a lot of the REA codes of ethics and things that a lot of our uh, certificates have, that's kind of built into the culture of being a professional and kind of doing that. And uh, maybe in some ways I'm preaching to the choir to you and Cliff and Joe and even some of the people on this call who I see in the log who, been there and done that know what i'm talking about but you know cliff's gonna create the blog and there's gonna be other people that might listen to this youtube and i think the message is important and uh anyway i'm glad it's out there thanks thank you pete cliff final questions or comments i guess maybe a couple of a couple of comments i think it, this kind of goes back to um you know, I, I suspect some of the things that, that are taught in your course, Norris, that, uh, you know, when we get dirty, uh, we wash. And a lot of times the same things we wash with are pretty effective at decontaminating a wide range of contaminants from, you know, microbes to carbon, you know, fire related, uh, you know, contaminants and even uh, things that are worse than that, dioxins and furans and so on and so forth. There are methods and uh, cleanup ways to get rid of it. And a lot of these things end up, you know, coming down to deep cleaning, you know, when you're deep cleaning and thoroughly. And, and I agree that, you know, dust is an issue, regardless of, of, of where it's at. And a lot of the bad stuff, regardless, whether it's microbes or uh, radiation from a nuclear you know, situation or accident, a lot of the stuff ends up in the dust, you know, yep. <laughs> and same thing, in right. same thing in hospitals. I mean, you, you got to be careful about the dust. And I think, uh, you know, yeah. dealing with dust properly, uh, you know, crosses a lot of, uh, you know, industries that we deal with and, and a lot of potential problems. I, I agree. One of the, one of the, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily like a whole lot of oversight, but uh, it's necessary. But one of the things that OSHA brought on that that I think is really great, and the the, the things that go along with that uh, transcend all of the type of work that we do, is the silica standard. 
uh, and that recognition of, of the risk there and, and the engineering controls that really should be employed in far more uh, activities that we do than, than just the, the concern with the silica. Norris, real quick before we go, have you had any close calls with exposure to infectious agents? And can you share that with our audience? Personally, no. And that's because if I'm going to go into that sort of an environment, I'm going to make sure that I'm well protected. I understand the risks and we have redundant safety uh, processes in place. The one thing that happened on a project I was involved with, which is uh, a little unique and you don't really think about it. We were working in a pharmaceutical uh, clean room during a, a shutdown, but we're in full PPE. And this is a situation where you, you're going through an ante room, you're, you're you know, doffing all your personal gear and, and putting on the PPE and moving into that space, wearing uh, powered air purifying respirators and, and, and the like. Uh, and one of our team had a stroke. And oh. what we never planned for or considered was how do you take that person back out through that doffing process in an emergency basis where, where minutes count, as well as how are you going to get the EMS personnel and their equipment through that process? And we uh, we found ourselves in a, in a bit of a scramble working with the facilities folks there and, and doing some, some hasty risk assessments and uh, and and figuring out how to do that. Uh, so as a result of that, uh, I look at at projects that we're going into uh, from a from a, a an unexpected uh, health emergency standpoint, uh, acute at the moment. And how are we going to deal with that? Yeah, you got a guy working in an attic and he has a heart attack. How do you get him out of that attic? Uh, that's a All great right. point. Excellent, excellent way to finish things up. Before we go, is there anything you'd like to add? I appreciate the time. All right, Norris Gearhart, we appreciate having you. I also want to thank my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. John, you got to have faith at the controls. Pete Consigli, the restoration industry's global watchdog. Most importantly, our growing group of loyal audience and also our sponsors will be uh, out by next week. We're off for Memorial Day, um, and then we'll be back in two weeks with the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reel saying thanks for listening.